Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Horizon Post Office scandal is a horrendous miscarriage of justice that ruined hundreds of lives. Politicians of all parties will rightly reflect on what they should have done sooner. The UK Government has now acted to overturn the wrongful convictions of innocent victims. In Scotland, however, prosecutions were handled by the Crown Office, not the Post Office. So can I ask the First Minister, has he established if a consent motion to UK law is the fastest way to clear all victims here in Scotland? And will he confirm to Parliament how he'll work with the UK Government to overturn these convictions as quickly as possible? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, can I first and foremost pay tribute to Alan Bates and all the other hundreds of campaigners yeah, yeah. as sub-postmasters <laughs> sub all of the sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses who campaign tirelessly over decades to ensure that they receive justice, justice they are still waiting for. Of course, it should not have taken a TV drama for action to have to be taken. And Douglas Ross is right. Uh, there is a need for reflection for all of those uh, involved. And the post office is, of course, a wholly uh, reserved institution which is accountable uh, to UK government uh, ministers. The difference, as Douglas Ross rightly points out here, is that prosecutions in Scotland have been taken forward by the Independent Crown and Procurator Fiscal uh, Service. I spoke to the Lord Advocate uh, just this morning and the Solicitor General uh, this morning, uh, and she uh, is willing uh, to provide a, a briefing uh, to uh, any MSPs uh, that have uh, an interest in terms of the Crown's own handling uh, of uh, these issues. Uh, to answer uh, Douglas Ross's question directly, uh, the Justice Secretary has written to her counterpart in the UK Government to say we are willing to work with the UK Government in relation to legislation they are bringing forward to overturn wrongful, uh, wrongful uh, convictions. Uh, I think the quickest way and fastest way to do that probably would be through the LCM uh, process, but there are a number of complexities to have to navigate uh, and to have to work through for some of the reasons that Douglas Ross has already uh, highlighted. So I think we will, of course, engage uh, immediately and urgently, and as we already have done with the UK Government. But what is absolutely certain, whether you are in Scotland or any other part of the United Kingdom and have been impacted and affected by this, that sub-postmasters have waited far too long for justice, they shouldn't have to wait a moment longer. Douglas yeah, yeah. Ross. I join the, the First Minister in congratulating Alan Bates and others, as I did in the House of Commons earlier this week. Uh, victims and the public will rightly ask why it's taken so long for this deep injustice to be corrected. And multiple political parties and many individuals should have and could have acted sooner. Blame starts with the post office, but people are understandably looking at what others could have done. Scotland's Crown Office were made aware of concerns with the Horizon system in 2013, more than 10 years ago. Dr Andrew Tickell, a senior law lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University, said this week, and I quote, the revelation that the Crown Office knew of problems is huge. He continued, did they stop prosecuting? Did it occur to them that any of their cases before 2013 might now be unsafe because of these uncertainties? And he added that Scotland was just at the beginning of addressing the miscarriage of justice, while England and Wales were much, much further down the line. I'm just quoting a law professor, so I'm, I'm simply asking the First Minister... Let's hear Mr Ross. ...does he agree that the process here in Scotland needs to be accelerated? First Minister. I would say to uh, Douglas Ross, first and foremost, let's remember, of course, that the, uh, and there is a public inquiry, of course, uh, underway, but I think it's been well established, of course, that uh, the inaccurate data presented by the, and uh, inaccurate evidence presented by the post office is at the very heart uh, of the scandal. And the post office, of course, uh, is accountable and has been accountable to UK government minister and ministers over many successive uh, UK government. So that will all undoubtedly be uh, a matter of interrogation and questioning by the public inquiry. Uh, in terms of the Crown Office, and I reiterate the point that Lord Advocate is willing to meet with members of the Scottish Parliament to talk them through what the Crown has done, because these are independent functions of the uh, Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service. Uh, but my understanding is uh, that when uh, the, the Crown Office was told in 2013 uh, by post office 
uh, solicitors uh, about uh, the horizon, uh, the challenges around the horizon evidence. Uh, they continued that dialogue uh, with the post office, uh, but immediately in September 2013, they uh, made it aware uh, and provided guidance to every Scottish prosecutor at the earliest possible uh, point in time to treat cases reported by the post office uh, on their individual regard to their facts and circumstances and evidence which did not rely upon Horizon. They then spent the next couple of years between 2013 and 2015 in continual dialogue with the post office to try to get further detail around the evidential basis. And uh, just to conclude the position uh, post-2015 uh, uh, with regard to assurances uh, provided uh, is that uh, in 2015 uh, the Crown Prosecution Service issued instructions to all prosecutors not to proceed with any post office case in which a sufficiency of evidence was dependent on evidence from the Horizon system. So no cases prosecuted effectively from 2015 that where, where the evidence was dependent on evidence from the Horizon uh, system. Uh, in terms of uh, where we are in relation Briefly, to the process first, Mr. with please. the Scottish Criminal Case uh, Review uh, Commission, uh, what I'm willing to do is work with the UK Government to look at a process which effectively en masse uh, seeks to overturn any wrongful convictions. Yeah, yeah. Douglas Ross. So the actions of the post office were despicable and, and probably criminal, but the actions of the Crown Office here in Scotland should trouble us greatly. There was a sudden spike in cases involving people who were some of the most trusted in their communities, but the Crown Office proceeded anyway. That was until 2013, and suddenly they decided not to proceed with a case in the Gorbals. Now, the First Minister has just articulated that it was September 2013 when the Crown Office first found out and sent out that information, but it wasn't. We know on the 29th of January 2013 that a prosecutor fiscal cited, and I quote, issues with Horizon as the reason for not proceeding with a case in January 2013, not in September 2013. Stuart Monroe, convener of the Law Society of Scotland's Criminal Law Committee, said the Procurator Fiscal should have gone public. He says, and this is his quote, the Procurator Fiscal has a legal duty to disclose relevant information of those accused of crimes, and that duty continues even after a trial is concluded. As soon as the Procurator Fiscal became aware of concerns about the reliability of Horizon, that should have been disclosed. So does the First Minister agree that Scotland's Crown Office has serious questions to answer here? First Minister. Well, what I would say to, to, to Douglas Ross, uh, in, in, and I say this uh, genuinely in sincerity, is that the real questions, of course, are for the Post Office yeah. Yeah. and, of course, the information that Post Office provided, not just to the Crown, to government ministers uh, as well. And that is why a public Let's inquiry the First Minister. Uh, is so important and anybody who has questions to answer should cooperate with that public inquiry. But let's not forget the Post Office is a wholly reserved institution yeah. directly accountable to UK uh, government ministers. Yeah. Uh, what I would say about questions to the Crown, and there, there are legitimate questions uh, to ask of the Crown. The Crown, of course, uh, does operate independently of government ministers uh, and, of course, as it should uh, operate independently of uh, myself as the first uh, minister. So there are uh, questions, very legitimate questions, that individuals and indeed members of this chamber will have for the Crown Office. I repeat uh, what Lord Advocate told me this morning. She is more than happy to provide a briefing uh, to uh, members of the Parliament that have an interest. I will uh, end uh, by reiterating the points I made at uh, the very beginning, uh, which is that sub-postmasters, sub-postmistresses have waited far too long for justice. It's incumbent on all of us to ensure that we not just get them access to that justice, but access to compensation too. Douglas Ross. Uh, the UK-wide inquiry, which the First Minister has mentioned, will look at all of these issues. And it's right it continues to scrutinise what happened. But we must examine the unique circumstances in Scotland where the Crown Office were responsible for prosecutions of innocent people. If the Crown Office knew of specific problems more than a decade ago, that raises serious questions. We don't know what they did, if anything, with that information. The Horizon Post Office scandal has devastated lives. It is the most appalling misjustice, uh, miscarriage of justice. Good people were criminalised because of an IT failure they had nothing to do with and a cover-up that lasted for years. It's right that no stone is left unturned in seeking answers. The Crown Office in Scotland must be transparent. 
Prosecutors were aware of issues with the flawed horizon system more than 10 years ago. So, First Minister, we don't need meetings or briefings from the Lord Advocate. We need her here in Parliament to answer questions about this scandal. Does the First Minister agree that the, the Lord Advocate should urgently come to this Parliament to answer questions? First Minister. Again, can, can I just remind uh, Douglas Watson, this is a really important point, of course, that the Lord Advocate... Uh, when, she, when she discharges her functions uh, as uh, head of the prosecution service, she does so independently uh, of me. Uh, when I spoke to Lord Advocate this morning, uh, she was more than happy to consider whether it was a briefing, whether it was a ministerial statement, whatever was appropriate, she was willing to consider that. And I'm certain the Lord Advocate uh, is listening to these exchanges. And of course, it will be for her to determine in her independent function as head of the prosecution service uh, on terms of how she should answer any of those questions. Let me reiterate uh, the point here uh, that Scottish prosecutors were told in September 2013 to treat cases reported by the, po the, the post office uh, in regard to their facts and circumstances and evidence which did not, did not re rely upon Horizon. So they should yeah. be uh, reported in, in, on their individual regard. Then, of course, no cases were prosecuted uh, from 2015 uh, where the sufficiency of evidence was dependent on the evidence from the Horizon system. And my understanding, again, uh, from uh, the conversations I've had with the Lord Advocate, is that uh, the engagement with the Post Office between 2013 and 2015, uh, the Crown Office were assured by Post Office and their legal representatives that issues that arise with the Horizon system in England did not impact on any live Scottish cases. So they continued to seek those assurances and then took the action that they did in both 2013 and 2015. Uh, uh, 15 uh, as well. Uh, pre uh, presiding officer, I simply end uh, where I started time and time again. Sub postmasters, sub postmistresses were telling uh, the UK uh, government, they were telling ministers in the UK government that the body that they are wholly responsible for, the post office, was lying. Uh, they were simply not telling the truth about the horizon system. Time and time again, they were not listened to. They have waited far too long for justice. They waited far too long for compensation. This government will work with the UK government to ensure they get access to not just justice, but access to the compensation they so uh, rightly deserve. Yeah, yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. The lives of potentially hundreds of Scottish sub-postmasters and their families were ruined by post office and Fujitsu. People lost their livelihoods and in some cases even lost their lives. They've described being ostracised in their communities, their families shunned and their children targeted. It is a national disgrace. I welcome that these convictions will be overturned, but there is more to this scandal. Unlike in England and Wales, where the post office itself brought these prosecutions, in Scotland they were carried out by the Crown Office and the Procurator for School. And as we've heard, we know ministers in the Crown were made aware of concerns around unsafe prosecutions in 2013. So can I ask the First Minister what conversations he, his Justice Secretary and the Lord Advocate have had about the role of Scottish institutions in prosecuting these cases and how this was allowed to happen for so long? First Minister. Uh, let me just be clear, uh, whether I was Justice Secretary at the time or indeed in my current role as First Minister, it would be wholly inappropriate for any government minister to demand to see the evidential basis for a case that the Crown was prosecuting. I, I know Anna Sarwar is not asking that, but I'm making the point here uh, that if the, the, the issue here is the evidence that was provided by the post office, it would be wrong for me to, in any ministerial position to suggest that I need to see that evidential basis in any individual prosecution. Anna Sarwar asked what conversations I've had with Lord Advocate. I had a conversation again this morning with the Lord Advocate, and the Lord Advocate stressed a number of points. She's happy to provide a timeline in terms of uh, how the Crown has responded. Uh, she is very confident about uh, the Crown's uh, response. They were told in 2013 about possible problems. They issued guidance to their individual prosecutors in 2013. They stopped prosecuting cases in 2015 after a period of uh, continual uh, conversation with the Post Office, stopped prosecuting cases in 2015 with a sufficiency of evidence was dependent uh, on the horizon uh, system. And Lord Advocate is open to briefing members of the Scottish Parliament. And again, as we've already heard, whether that's through a briefing or whether that's through a ministerial statement, I'm sure Lord Advocate uh, will, of course, uh, reflect. But Anna Sauer is absolutely right at the heart of this. Hundreds of people right across the United Kingdom whose lives and reputations have been tarnished and ruined. It is incumbent 
that the, this government works with any other government, including the UK government, across uh, the United Kingdom to ensure that justice uh, is, is, uh, justice is forthcoming and, comp and access to compensation is not impeded. Anna Sarwar. <clears throat> there are big questions for the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal, and I think it would be right if the Lord Advocate came to this Parliament to answer those questions from members. But this goes beyond convictions. Uh, disturbing accounts from the public inquiry have revealed that post office employees were going door to door in Scotland to threaten and extort money from sub postmasters. In behaviour reminiscent of the mob, these stories show that the post office behaved like a private police force yeah. and showed little regard for the law in Scotland. Sub postmasters were pressured into accepting accusations of false accounting and forced to hand over thousands of pounds that day or face imprisonment. First Minister, if any other organisation had behaved like this in Scotland, we would expect to see criminal investigations into their conduct. So does he agree that this potentially criminal behaviour by post office officials in Scotland should be properly investigated so the scandal does not go unpunished? First Minister. Uh, can I say to uh, Anna Sawar, um, and I should have perhaps said this at the beginning of my response to Douglas Ross, I, I uh, absolutely um, empathise in the strongest way possible with the harrowing tales that we've heard from sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses right up and down the country. My own family are sub-postmasters. My late grandfather was a, a sub-postmaster. Uh, My step-grand uh, continues uh, to be so, uh, although not affected by this uh, particular uh, scandal. What I would say to Anna Sauer, the big difference, of course, is that the post office does not have the ability to bring private prosecutions here in Scotland. That is very different, of course, to the situation in England uh, and uh, Wales. Uh, the the behaviours uh, of the post office should absolutely rightly be interrogated. Uh, that is why there is a public inquiry. And of course, if there are any behaviours that are possibly criminal in Scotland, again, it is not for me uh, to investigate uh, those. It would rightly be for the independent Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service to do so. I've got every confidence that the Crown uh, will look into allegations uh, uh, or any, uh, any uh, allegations that are made uh, to them about any potential criminal behaviour. Anna Sarwar. President Officer, too often in this country, when there is an injustice, the first instinct of institutions and government is to protect themselves. Whether it's the sub-postmasters taking on the post office, the Hillsborough scandal, the C. diff scandal at the Vale of Leven, or victims at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. It shouldn't take victims disclosing the most harrowing moments of their lives to shame both of Scotland's governments into action. But it happens too often. Government is meant to be on the people's side, but tragically when victims come looking for justice, all they get are more barriers put in their way. And the silence, denial and cover-up compounds the injustice and amplifies their pain. Now, ministers, be they Scottish or UK, always say we must learn the lessons and it can't be allowed to happen again. But it does. So does the First Minister agree that the priority for government should be truth and justice for victims rather than protecting institutions or protecting individual reputations? First Minister. Uh, look, I, I do agree uh, that that is of paramount importance. I do remind uh, Anna Sauer, of course, the Labour Party were in the UK government for a number of years while sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses were telling UK government postal ministers, Labour ministers, that the post office was presenting inaccurate data. So I think it is important for all UK-based parties in particular to reflect on their relationship with the post office and whether they were listening uh, or not. In terms of, uh, in terms of the government's uh, approach, uh, I think we can demonstrate time and time and time again where issues have been brought to this government, uh, we have not only engaged, uh, often in really difficult conversations, engaged with individuals who bring forward uh, harrowing stories and tales, but where necessary, of course, we will always investigate, whether that's through uh, the independence of uh, commissioners that we have here, whether it's the uh, Patient Safety uh, Commissioner, which I'm pleased uh, that bill has uh, passed, whether it's through the duty of candour in relation to the NHS, whether it's through public inquiries that we instruct. Uh, this government's approach has been and will always be to ensure that we seek the truth and that we always ensure that we do right by the people of Scotland. And when it comes to this particular issue, when it comes to sub-postmasters here in Scotland, we will work with whoever we need to, including, of course, uh, the UK government, to ensure that those individuals not only get access to justice, but compensation which has been denied to them for far too long. Yeah. Yeah. Question number three, Alec Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. 
Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that reply. Netazines are a kind of synthetic opioid, 50 times stronger than heroin. They're often delivered in a single pill or disguised as other substances entirely. Presiding officer, the synthetic opioid epidemic across North America has already claimed hundreds of thousands of lives, and public health officials and charities are worried these drugs are coming to Scotland. We know that nitazines have been linked to the deaths of nine Scots this summer, or since the summer. And the front line in our response to these new substances is information, detection and treatment. Presiding officer, we still have the worst drug deaths in all of Europe. So can I ask the First Minister why his budget delivers a real, ter delivers a real terms cut to drug services just as this new threat is emerging? First Minister. Uh, can I say that we are committed and uh, haven't uh, reduced the money in relation to the national mission uh, for uh, de dealing with uh, drugs uh, deaths? Uh, Alice Cole Hamilton is absolutely right about the danger of nitazines. In fact, the, the drugs minister and I uh, spoke about this uh, threat recently. I also spoke uh, when I was in uh, New York last year uh, to the health commissioner uh, in uh, New York about the real dangers uh, of uh, synthetic uh, opioids, which Alice Cole Hamilton is right uh, to say that they are a real epidemic uh, in, 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 in America. And we are not complacent about the challenges uh, that we face uh, here. So we will continue to invest uh, in the national mission in tackling uh, drugs uh, deaths. Uh, when it comes to the specific action that we're taking uh, around uh, nitazines, uh, and, and, and there's a number of actions uh, that we are taking uh, in relation uh, to them and in relation to synth synthetic opioids, I'm more than happy for the Drugs Minister uh, to meet uh, with Alice Cole Hamilton to give him more detail about the actions and the range of actions that we're taking in this regard. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Jenny. Also, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is regarding any implications for its net zero ambitions of the UK Government's offshore petroleum licensing bill, which seeks changes to the licensing regime, including how regularly licensing rounds are held. First Minister. Decisions on offshore oil and gas licensing remain reserved to the UK Government. The offshore petroleum bill, along with other recent announcements, demonstrates that it is not serious about the climate crisis. That instead of licensing ever more fossil fuel extraction, which the bill would absolutely see happen on an annual basis, the UK government should be supporting a fair and just energy transition in line with its climate commitments. So we've repeatedly called for a rigorous climate compatibility test to be applied to all new oil and gas developments. However, the checkpoint introduced by the UK government before the latest licensing round is neither robust nor is it frankly transparent. So here in Scotland, we remain absolutely committed to a just transition to net zero by 2045. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. And the former UK Energy Minister, Chris Skidmore, has recently resigned as an MP in protest over the bill. And the COP26 President, Sir Alec Sharma MP, has stated that the bill, and I quote, reinforces that unfortunate perception about the UK rowing back on climate action. Presenting officer, even those within the Tory party uh, recognise the UK government is not serious about climate change. And does the First Minister agree with me that the just transition to help retrain and reskill the oil and gas workforce is vital to help deliver the energy we use? That any party that forms the next UK government needs to be serious about climate change and a push towards net zero, and that only as an independent nation, the people of Scotland will get energy policy fit for the future and also the emergency that we are facing. Yes. First Minister. Yes. Well, I, I do agree with that. I mean, the fact that the Prime Minister spent more time on his private jet than he did at COP28 tells you uh, his level of commitment yeah. Yeah. to tackling the climate crisis. And of course, 2023 was and has been confirmed as the hottest year uh, on uh, record. So those who refuse in the face of all of that evidence to take the necessary action are completely abdicating their responsibility, not just to current generations, but to the future generations and indeed to our planet as well. So uh, I do agree, responding to the climate emergency is an absolute imperative. There should be a political uh, consensus. I'm looking forward to meeting with party leaders uh, later uh, in the coming uh, weeks to discuss how we can collectively work to tackle the climate crisis. And what would really help is that every time the Scottish Government, of course, proposes action uh, to tackle the climate crisis, if the opposition didn't oppose it, simply for its opposition's sake. Yeah. Mark Kruskal. This latest episode in Tory climate denial threatens to deepen our alliance on climate wrecking fossil fuels, exactly when we should be doubling down on cheap and clean renewables. In Scotland, we're making 
great progress, record investment in renewables as a result of planning reforms, and tens of thousands of quality new green jobs. And the draft energy strategy and just transition plan reflects both the scientific evidence of climate change and that economic opportunity by clearly stating a presumption against new oil and gas fields. So could I ask the First Minister what impact this new bill will have on that exact commitment? First Minister. I can say that uh, as the Scottish Government we absolutely value the exceptional role the oil and gas industry has played over many, many decades here in Scotland and of course the exceptional efforts of hard working, uh, the, the incredibly hard working workforce uh, in the oil and gas uh, industry. They are a vital service, a uh, vital uh, key uh, component of Scotland's economic uh, success. Uh, but it is the case, regardless of what anybody says uh, in this chamber, the facts are the facts. And of course, the North Sea, uh, North sea is a declining uh, basin. And therefore, it is not just in the planet's interest of that, of course, it is to have that just transition uh, to net zero. It's in our economic interest, given that decline of the North Sea Basin, but also given the exceptional potential uh, of our renewable uh, sources in order to ensure that that potential uh, is uh, unleashed. Uh, we are in the process of finalising that energy strategy and just transition plan in light of the consultation responses uh, received, and our focus will be on reducing uh, emissions uh, and on that just transition away from fossil fuels uh, and towards uh, unleashing the potential of our net zero uh, green technologies. Ash Regan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Rosebank comes on stream and the 40s, which accounts for around 40% of oil, continues to flow, refining must be carried out at Grangemouth. Will the First Minister commit today to bring together Unite the Union, Petro Ineos, yep. and the UK Government to create the required rescue package to increase the profitability of the plant and secure its long-term future as a Scottish refinery. First Minister. Well, the Future Industries uh, Board, which is looking at this very issue, is meeting, I believe, in the coming uh, weeks. And, of course, uh, Neil Gray and I uh, have had conversations with the owners uh, of the Grangemouth uh, refinery. And there will be continued discussions that are ongoing. All of us want to see uh, a viable future for Grangemouth. We also want to make sure it's a sustainable future uh, and, of course, do our very best to ensure uh, that there are not job losses at Grangemouth. Uh, so we will do what we can. That Future Industry Board will meet, and uh, I'll ensure that, of course, Neil Gray uh, writes to Ash Reagan uh, with the full details of the actions that we are taking, which includes not just engaging with the owners uh, of uh, Grangemouth, but also engaging with trade union colleagues too. Question number five, Rose McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is, to reports that the promise is not on track to deliver effective change for Scotland's care experienced people. First Minister. Keeping the promise is an absolute top priority for this government. And when I met with Fiona Duncan, the independent strategic advisor for the promise late last year, she confirmed her view that the promise can be met by 2030. And I'm determined that we will do exactly that. Over the last year, we've made substantial progress on a whole range of aspects of the promise, including the Scottish recommended allowance for fostering kinship carers and investing £6 million in the Bairns House Pathfinders. There is, of course, uh, more to do of that, there's simply no doubt, but let me assure the Chamber that this Government will do everything in our power to uh, keep and also deliver the promise to Scotland's care experienced people. Ross McCall. I thank the First Minister for that response. Four years on and the lives of care experienced people in Scotland are no better. He will be aware of the comments of Megan Moffat of Who Cares Scotland, who said that despite laudable ambitions, there's no clear detail on how the promise should happen, who should do it, when, by, and how much it will cost. The outgoing Children's Commissioner stated that Nicola Sturgeon absolutely failed Scotland's young people, and with that self-same MSP admitting recently that there is an implementation gap. So, First Minister, when will this SNP Green government stop tinkering round the edges of meaningful change, empower and adequately fund our councils to do the job, get the promise back on track and stop failing most vulnerable people in our society? First Minister. Uh, I have to say it takes some level of brass neck for a Conservative yeah. member to stand here and demand more money for local services and local government when they are continually, continually, continually cutting our budget time and time and time again, a real terms cut uh, to our budget over a number 
of years. I also disagree fundamentally with this uh, suggestion from Ros McCall that things have not improved. When I look at the latest published data showing that there was almost 2,000 2, fewer looked after children July 2022 than at the start of the promise, which was July 2020. That's a 12.9% reduction. But these are not just numbers. That's almost 2,000 fewer children, young people, families uh, that have been uh, in, uh, impacted uh, positively and affected uh, positively too. So I'm not suggesting to Ros McCall or anybody else that there are not issues in relation to the implementation uh, of uh, the promise. But in my recent meeting with Fiona Duncan, who I think is widely respected right across this chamber, uh, there is a determination and understanding that we can absolutely keep the promise. And that's why we'll work uh, with Fiona Duncan, with uh, all the stakeholders in relation to keeping the promise uh, on the implementation plan 2040-30. And I can promise uh, those individuals, those young people and indeed care experienced people, whatever stage of life they're at, that this government is absolutely resolute, unwavering in its commitment to keeping and delivering the promise to them. Nicola Sturgeon. Does the First Minister agree that to keep the promise, the significant progress that has already been made it does need to continue and now intensify? In particular, does he agree that the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund is absolutely essential to provide the funding to transform services so that families are better supported and fewer young people then need to enter care in the first place and to that end will he give a commitment that this fund will be delivered in full and that it will be fully invested to improve the lives of the young people present and future to whom that promise has been made first minister yeah, absolutely first and foremost can i recognize that there frankly would not be a promise if it wasn't for the efforts of the former first minister of uh, nicola Sturge. and I think Nicola Sturgeon would be the first to say that there would be no promise if it wasn't for the efforts of young, care, experienced people. So I want to pay tribute to them for the impact that they have had on all of us, not just on government, but I suspect every single member of the Scottish Parliament who's engaged with care, experienced young people and care, experienced people uh, more generally will have been uh, impacted. Uh, I have had the pleasure of engaging with a number of care experienced people in my time as First Minister and before, and most recently hosting them in Butte House uh, for a Christmas party, which was not just great fun, but actually gave me the opportunity to hear from them directly on the improvements we had to, to make. To answer Nicola Sturgeon's question uh, directly, uh, the whole family wellbeing fund is, of course, a central co a component uh, for us in terms of keeping uh, the promise and despite the very challenging uh, autumn statement, despite the continued cuts over a number of years uh, to our budget, uh, we have prior prioritised £50 million for the fund in the 24-25 budget, as I say, even in the face of significant financial uh, constraints, reflecting uh, our priority and the importance that we attach to keeping the promise. Question number six, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what urgent steps have been taken to address reports of a mental health crisis with an increase in calls to the NHS 24 mental health hub. First Minister. There is no question that for many people recent times have been extremely challenging, exacerbated of course by COVID and we know the cost of living uh, crisis. So we are committed to support people's mental health and wellbeing uh, just as we are to support their physical health. Two, our recently published mental health and wellbeing strategy, uh, delivery plan and workforce action plan recognises that an effective mental health system must address all levels of need. They set out what people have a right to expect from high quality mental health services and the actions we're taking to achieve those aims. Uh, these actions will continue to evolve, of course, over time, and I'm always open to constructive dialogue with opposition parties on where they think we can go further. Uh, the member references the NHS 24 uh, call volumes. It's good uh, that more people feel able to come forward and ask for help for their mental health, and our substantially increased investment in NHS 24 is helping to ensure that more calls can be responded to. Paul Sweeney. Data from NHS 24 reveals that calls regarding alcohol problems have risen by over 600 in two years, and calls regarding psychotic symptoms have more than doubled since 2021. That is not simply people presenting for the first time, First Minister. That's people who are not being seen urgently in the way that they should. And last year, astonishingly, over 7, 
1,000 children and young people were turned away from CAMS. That is an average of 26 children a day. Primary and community care services are under growing pressure, and yet ministers have failed to start recruiting the promised additional 1,000 mental health roles, whilst cutting the budget for the coming year by £5 million after inflation. Will the First Minister accept that his mental health strategy will fail unless it is properly resourced? First Minister. Can I say, when it comes to mental health funding, this government has a record that we are proud of standing on. And again, this is in the face of the most difficult set of finances uh, and, and constrictions that we have faced uh, in the history of, of devolution. The autumn statement from the UK government was the worst case scenario uh, for Scotland. But despite that, the difficult decisions, of course, have to be made uh, across government in terms of uh, budget. But this is not this has not stopped are focused on, on key uh, priorities. And since 2020, 2021, the Mental Health Directorate's programme budget has more than doubled. When it comes to staffing, which is mentioned, uh, which is mentioned uh, by uh, Paul uh, Sweeney, uh, rock, uh, after uh, following our record-breaking investment in CAMS, which I've just mentioned, uh, CAMS staffing has more than doubled under this government. It's gone up by over 126% uh, since uh, 2007. And these are difficult decisions that are being made right across the United Kingdom because of those uh, cuts coming from uh, the UK uh, government. In fact, if I look at Labour run Wales in their 24-25 budget, here's a quote from their budget. We can no Thank longer you, First increase Minister. funding by 15% in 24-25 as was originally planned. We've reduced existing mental health budget by a further six million. So my point is, of course, that we will do everything we possibly can Briefly, to First increase Minister. the investment in mental health, uh, but we cannot do that in the face of continued cuts from the UK government. Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Research indicates that 10% of children and young people have a clinically diagnosable mental health issue, and that's around three children in every class. Neurodiverse children and young people are struggling in particular right now, with Scotland currently facing a severe shortage of ADHD medication, which affects approximately 26,000 people. Can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government can do to help address this issue? First Minister. Karen Adam, Karen, Karen Adam forgive me, uh, does raise a very, very important issue uh, indeed, which I know impacts a number of people across the country, and I do recognise the impact of the global medicine shortages on people living with ADHD and the impact on their families uh, as well. The pricing and supply of medicines is, of course, a reserve matter for the UK government, but we do engage with them uh, regularly and have engaged with them specifically on this particular issue. Uh, the shortages are caused by a combination of manufacturing issues and a global increase in demand. And, of course, the Brexit red tape certainly hasn't helped. It's anticipated that most of the shortages of ADHD medicine will be resolved uh, this month. Uh, NHS Scotland has robust systems in place to manage medicine shortages when they do arise, and anyone who is affected should, of course, speak to the clinical team in the first instance. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Tess White. Mining officer. Matrix is one of Brechin's biggest employers, but most of its employees right now await news of their jobs as the manufacturing firm considers, it, considers its future. Storm Babette has been blamed when the factory was under four feet of water with extensive machine damage. Can the First Minister tell us what his government has done to protect and preserve these highly skilled jobs in Brekin and when the SNP will finally fulfil its promise to support the town at its greatest time of need? First Minister. I, of course, uh, did uh, visit uh, Brecon uh, after uh, Storm uh, Babette, and of course we have uh, been able to dispense with thousands uh, of pounds in relation to business uh, recovery uh, grants, and I can get the exact detail uh, to Tess White in that regard. So we are stepping up to help uh, the people and the businesses of Brecon through funding that we have uh, made available, and we were quick, uh, of course, not just to visit, but to make sure that we acted uh, in terms of Matrix International more generally, more broadly. Uh, I know that the Cabinet Secretary uh, is engaged. I know that Scottish Enterprise continue to be engaged. I was very disappointed to hear reports of potential job losses at Matrix uh, International. Uh, and, of course, the Scottish Government will provide uh, support through our PACE uh, initiative. PACE has already met with the company to offer support to the workforce, but Neil Gray will continue to, to, to uh, remain engaged, as will Scottish Enterprise. I'm happy to write to Tess White with further details of that engagement. Pam Duncan Glancy. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the Stage 1 debate on my Disabled Persons Transition to Adulthood Bill, the Government argued that a change in the law was not needed because good practice on ASN was spreading. New data from the Government's school census shows that the number of children with ASN getting legal support via a coordinated support plan has reached its lowest point ever. Despite promised action from this Government, including as far back as 2016, things are getting worse, not better, and a generation are failed. So can I ask the First Minister, with countless promises from his Government that things will get better, why is support for young people with additional support needs getting so much worse? First Minister. We have uh, invested significantly in ASN support uh, for our young people. Uh, what I would say to uh, Pam Duncan Glancy is, of course, that there are a number of reasons why the government doesn't, didn't feel that they could support uh, her bill. But we are always open to work with Pam Duncan Glancy, with any member right across this chamber, uh, to see what further work we can do, what more we can do to support our young people when it comes to the ASN uh, support they required. But, of course, what we will continue to do is not just uh, in, invest uh, in that, we will continue to engage with our local authorities who, of course, in Budget 24-25, uh, as presented by the Deputy First Minister, are getting a significant increase in their budget, which will hopefully help in this regard. Jim Fairley. Thank you very much, President Officer. First Minister, like many others, I have been contacted by constituents on the Scottish Government's position uh, on the bully dog and the position of the bully dog breed, the XL bully dog breed. In light of the new controls on the breed in England and Wales, which will come into effect on the 1st of February, can the First Minister outline when his government will reach a decision on their own on this issue? First Minister. Well, uh, first uh, and foremost, it's probably worth saying that the, uh, the, the description of what is happening in England and Wales is not a, a ban on XL uh, bully uh, dogs. Of course, they can still, uh, owners can still uh, keep an XL bully dog. They have to make sure it's registered on the exemption index. They have to fulfil the other criteria uh, of the legislation. And of course, when this was first announced without any consultation, uh, with the Scottish Government, or indeed, as far as I can see, any consultation with an animal uh, welfare stakeholders. Uh, we committed the Scottish Government to engage with animal welfare stakeholders and, of course, uh, to continue to engage with the UK uh, Government. What has become clear, I'm afraid, in the last few weeks is that we have seen a flow uh, of XL Billy Dogs coming uh, to Scotland, a number of people uh, transferring, uh, coming to, 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 to Scotland to bring XL Billy Dogs uh, here to the country. Uh, as such, uh, and we will give further details uh, to uh, members of the Scottish Parliament through a ministerial statement if the Parliamentary Bureau uh, agrees next week, uh, we will, uh, in essence, replicate the legislation that is in England uh, and uh, Wales here in Scotland, because ultimately, although we do have uh, a very good system of dog control uh, notice uh, schemes, um, and, and we do take the approach of deed uh, not breed. We have to respond uh, to the situation uh, as it currently stands, and therefore uh, we will do what we need to do to ensure public safety. But further detail will be given uh, by uh, the appropriate minister next week, subject to parliamentary bureau's agreement. Liam Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. New figures show that 11 people have died and 69 have been seriously injured in accidents on the A96 in the last four years. The Scottish Government promised in 2011 that it would be duelled by 2030, but that is now subject to a review at a cost of £5 million and whose publication has been delayed by over a year. So, First Minister, when will this review finally be published and will this Government ever duel this killer road? First Minister. What, uh, of course, doesn't help when it comes to our capital infrastructure projects is a 10 per cent cut to our capital budget over the next five years. So what Conservative members can't do is come to this chamber, demand we continue to invest in roads, but simultaneously cut our budget time and time and time uh, again. So as confirmed Let's through hear our programme for government, we remain absolutely committed to improving the A96, including duelling Inverness to Nairn and the Nairn Bypass which already has ministerial consent following that public local inquiry. The Minister for Transport is due, uh, I believe, uh, is due to meet, I know, with uh, uh, members uh, uh, that have an interest in the A96 uh, on the 25th uh, of January. We'll provide a more detailed update on this scheme, along with details about how the review uh, is being undertaken on the wider A96 corridor. However, in the interim, let me absolutely assure uh, all members that preparation uh, work continues at pace on the Inverness uh, to Nairn, including the Nairn bypass section, and I can advise that I expect orders for the scheme that will be made 
that will be made in the first quarter of 2024 with a view to completing the necessary statutory process. And Neil Booby. Thank you, President Officer. The Accounts Commission today are discussing their report into Renfrewshire Council's handling of the Dargaville schools debacle, estimated to cost Renfrewshire's children and taxpayers up to £170 million. The Commission has stated the Council faces a challenge to rebuild trust and confidence. They have also stated the community will be dealing with the consequences of this era for some time. Given that, how can the First Minister have confidence in Renfrewshire Council when so many local parents do not? And given funding for a new Thorn Primary School has been rejected by the Government, what support will the Government provide to Renfrewshire's children to stop them paying the price of their Council's incompetence? First Minister. Uh, can I say, uh, first and foremost, that Neil Bibby is right, and he has been right over a number of months, to raise uh, the serious concerns that parents have in Renfrewshire uh, over uh, this particular situation. And they will, the Council will have to reflect very hard uh, in relation to how they rebuild trust uh, with uh, parents in this, uh, in, in this regard. Uh, we do have, uh, from the Scottish Government's perspective, a good record of investing uh, in schools in terms of new schools and also refurbishments uh, right across uh, local authorities, including, of course, uh, in Renfrewshire as well. And in terms of what the Scottish Government can do, of course, through the budget announced by Deputy First Minister, the Budget 24-25, we are giving a significant uplift uh, to local government. So we'll continue to engage uh, with local government and with Renfrewshire Council on this issue, but it is the responsibility of the local authority and of Renf Renfrewshire Council to ensure they rebuild trust uh, with the parents and the families affected. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Rhoda Grant, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the debate begins. <laughs>